Hello everyone, this is Terry with Futures IO, and as always, I would like to thank you for joining us today. Now, it's my pleasure to welcome back Linda Braffer Ratsky for today's webinar, Mean Reversion, Trend Trading, and Breakouts. If you have questions, please feel free to type them into the questions box throughout the webinar. We'll do our best to answer them at the end of the event. If you're watching this on YouTube, please do us a favor and give us a thumbs up if you enjoyed the webinar. And as always, please feel free to share, comment, and subscribe to the channel. It really helps us a lot. For trading news, events, and information, follow us on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter using at Futures.io. And now, without further delay, I will hand it over to Linda, and you'll get the pop-up again to share your screen. Okay, looking good. She is all yours. Hey, guys. Uh, I think it's been a year since I uh, last spoke, so thank you for jumping on. And uh, as we're all tongue-tied and uh, having our brains spin around after the last two days trading, I hope that you will find value in this. Big Mike promised that he would also post a link if you want to go back and review anything, or some of you have to leave early. You can listen to it at a later date, and please feel free free to pass on that link to your friends or associates if you find that they might find this of value as well. So Mike contacted me two or three months ago, and I've done quite a few webinars for his site now. And I said, well, you tell me what I best might speak on for your audience. And he suggested that he's seen a lot of people in probably condition from the last two years of trading, um, buying retracements, and there's all kinds of strategies that are centered around retracements in a trending type of market from VIX strategies, RSI strategies, mean reversion strategies, overbought, oversold type of things. And sometimes it's very difficult to differentiate between when buying a dip is truly um, starting to uh, be a breakout, a stronger breakout in the other direction. And the tricky thing is that Sometimes when these outliers, as I like to call them, or these less probable moves that actually can be the greater type of move, sometimes it, it, since we don't see that many of them, it's difficult to conceive of where the market can go, what it can do, uh, and, and so forth, because when you're buying a dip or a retracement, you have A, the previous swing high or swing low by which to measure things, as well as measured moves up, equal swings up, and so forth. And the market tends to be a little bit more orderly. Now, this is kind of humorous timing that I am doing this today because I just sent my book off to the printer last week, and the book was about how it seemed like I was on the wrong side of every outlier or big event or um, completely uh, abnormal type of movement in the markets. Yet I'm still here today, so that must mean that there's opportunity elsewhere. And in reviewing all these things and, and, and looking at the charts, some choice charts I posted in the book, it really is frightening sometimes how um, radical some moves can be, you know, when we're not in that normal channeling, well-behaved type of environment. And so what I wanted today was to give you some really simple guidelines and structures that you can consider. And uh, the main thing is that we don't have to be a jack of all trades uh, in, in our trading. You know, just loosely, we tend to categorize uh, some people are better at breakout trading. Um, some people are better at this mean reversion, which is simply looking at momentum divergences or, or playing for fluctuation around a central value, if you want to call that. And obviously, in a trending channeling environment, um, which really doesn't happen that much of the time, but I don't really need to say much about that. Now, it sounds pretty simplistic to put it in these three time frames or three types of, of styles, 
but you have to start somewhere um, with what you're doing because it is pretty magnificent, the amount of data and opportunity and markets and time frames that we have uh, you know, to seek opportunity. And it really comes down to being super discriminating uh, in, in what you are doing and what your program is, because otherwise the room for error and making reactions or uh, less probable uh, trades is so great. And especially when we have this increased dynamics of social media, TVs, blogs, Twitters, all these things that can serve as a distraction to pull us out of our game as well. So... Enough said, let me see if I can get this advancing here. And then we will be in business. All right, blah, blah, blah. By the way, I cut my hair all off so I don't look like that anymore. I'm back to my Dutch boy, Bob. I used this word agnostic and uh, I thought this was pretty suitable for at least defining me. And that is that there's a good part of the time that I really don't know what's going on. And I think that's a fallacy in the markets when I see people project or forecast too far in advance we can have general guidelines. For example, I can put up a weekly S&P chart and say it trades back down to the lower Keltner channel uh, once every three years. Uh, the average duration for that reaction down tends to be X, Y, Z, blah, blah, blah. So at least it provides a model but you can see how much back and forth and trading opportunity there is in the meantime. And we may or may not uh, get back down there in the general period that I was thinking about. So for me, agnostic, I really try to be open-minded and that also means take what the market gives me. So I have a setup, I put on the trade, sometimes you get a little, sometimes you get a lot, sometimes you get nothing. And it's also being super conscious about our biases. And I'm glad that there is such an increased awareness these days about this little problem of cognitive biases. So I describe myself as agnostic. Um, if somebody else wants to be a fundamentalist, I have to simply say that may work for them or it may not work for me, but I'm open-minded that perhaps it does work for them, but I know what works for me and I'm only concerned about what works for me. So I'm showing you my playing board, my game board, my rules, the way I have my data organized. And any time that I step over that line of projecting too far in advance or making too dramatic of a statement in terms of my beliefs about the market's action or where we might go, that is the ego creeping in and that usually leads to no good at all in, uh, in my trading. This was fun because these four charts here were charts that I actually have in my book and you can see they are all on different time frames, basically. And my main point that I wanted to make, and this was because Mike brought it up, talking about how people seem to trade thinking that there's some value area, and that's probably a throw over from market profile concepts, okay, that uh, everybody talks about the value area. But the problem is, value is going to change greatly depending on the look back period and it may not hold up as a value area going into the future and lastly traders should not be worrying about value we should be worrying about where is the immediate opportunity and where is the immediate supply demand imbalance and where can i go in and lock in a piece for a trade um, value might be more uh, prudent for an investor to consider, but even then valuations can greatly change 
uh, depending on which regime you're in, you know, in terms of which decade and so forth. So for me, I'm going to use some market profile concepts to illustrate things, but you don't need a market profile to see these things yourself. It's just going to help conceptually. Um, yes, I was in the 87 crash um, in uh, December. Well, it was actually October when the S&Ps dropped pretty significantly. We had been up 44% that year, and I started buying a little bit too soon on that big down bar, uh, and that was a ride. Um, the, the next chart over to the right was, believe it or not, the Fed came out and announced in the last hour, going into the last hour on a Wednesday, a surprise rate cut of half a basis point, which was in between FOMC meetings. And uh, where you see that arrow there, my husband, Damon, was a broker in the S&P pit, and his partner, who actually was one of the founders of GetGo, had a short position on, and he had buy stops in the S&Ps at 1231 to protect his short position. And you can see where his stop got triggered and you can see where he got filled. He got filled at the high. So just because he was a broker on the trading floor didn't protect him from the problems of zero liquidity in the market on a big event. Fortunately, I did not get caught up in that, but that's just another example of the randomness out there that can occur. Um, <laughs> the next chart in the bottom left corner, that was when the uh, Fed came in and announced that they were taking over Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. And in the last hour of that day, I had shorted uh, 600 S&P futures and 600 Russell futures. So that was an overnight gap of close to $4 million against me. But um, we traded our way out of that and still ended up on the month. But it was, again, a random outlier that sometimes we just can't predict. And then lastly, over on the far right, I'm sure all of you remember the flash crash, right? Uh, a quick uh, 70 points down and 80 points back up. And I, I had actually bought some S&P futures, a couple hundred, uh, right around that 1128 handle and uh, sold them out two minutes later with a flatten button because they dropped six points against me. And I, I thought there was a nuclear bomb that went off the way it was trading. And I got out around 1116. Uh, and then, of course, you can see where they dropped all the way down. So these are just some oddball examples of some very random outliers that we cannot predict and the main point is, is that technical analysis only carries you so far. So don't ever feel too confident. You know, I mean, you have to have confidence, obviously, to make the trade, but always recognize, you know, that we've got so many different variables at work. You know, it's not a closed system. The markets are not a closed system like a poker game would be or a, a, a mathematical, you know, model. Um, there's a lot more uh, oddball variables that nobody, nobody can predict. So in the big scheme of things, you don't need to be a jack of all trades. We just need to be ultra discriminating about the environment that we're trading. And you see that we've got lots of noise in the markets nowadays. The markets are not linear models. Um, you have billions and billions and billions of dollars now being run on little algorithmic artificial intelligence um, types of models. And often these models even fight with each other. So it's not like everybody's winning just doing algorithmic activity uh, and artificial intelligence. You know, they have their uh, problems in that arena as well, even though they do do very well. Um, so when you are studying your own, we have a different advantage in what we do because there's a lot of times where we can choose to stay out of the market and, um, you know, be extra 
selective about where we choose to play and where we go in and make our trades, assuming that you can keep your hand off of that mouse for more than five minutes during the middle of the day. And I'm saying that tongue in cheek because I know full well how addictive this game can be. Um, but we can choose where we want to go in. And so make it a point to study where your style fails and you will probably learn more from that than from doing the deductive logic to see why something works. Look for what types of factors could cause it to fail. And we're going to look at some of those today. And lastly, um, Last decade was the decade of the genetic algorithms and the neural networks and the artificial intelligence. And now the theme ever more increasingly is taking this Bayesian approach to the market, which is updating our models every data point. And this is instinctively what a professional trader does. It's following the market, not predicting it, but following it. And each new data point, I mean, think about a daily bar because I'm not suggesting you monitor ticks, but each new daily bar gives us one more piece of information that we can then update our models and adjust our probabilities. So that's what ultimately you're doing intuitively, hopefully consciously, uh, but it's not a pure science. So let's just go and look at this from here. I thought that I would start off with the crude um, because this is a very similar situation where at the bottom I've got a stochastic. You can see we've been in a steady uptrend of higher highs and higher lows. And we're talking about this dip that dropped from the top. And um, at this point in the game, it could be ambiguous, you know, we're sort of at the top of that other range. Um, and you have to ask yourself, what do you see here? I can tell you my clues that something was amiss. Um, and and part of that was, by the way, can you see my mouse on here if I do the mouse thing? Yep. Um, yep. Oh, see good. The mouse. oh, good. OK, this is really important because this is one of the patterns that <clears throat> for me is my best breakout trade. And I want to emphasize that if you do do breakouts, it it doesn't necessarily mean it has to be breakout from a, a, a prolonged daily chart formation or the Peter Brandt type of breakouts or, uh, you know, uh, 20 day high type of breakouts. I like the breakouts from these little small three bars because we'll look at how those look on a volume distribution, but it usually forms a a what you would call a volume node or the market has come into balance. So you've got three small range bars, all price overlap. So that to me is a market coming into balance. And then uh, the, the volatility breakout system went short, range expansion went short. You had a, a pretty good day down. And, and you know, the uh, if you were trading a system, it probably would have covered it the next day. But you can see what happened here on that. We made these new momentum lows on this two period rate of change, which for me is something that says a warning, caution, you know, get your ears up. Uh, something bigger could be happening here. But it also would be very easy to think, OK, we had a good bonk down 70 handle. Big round numbers can often provide support. I'm a huge believer of trading around these big round numbers. Obviously, today, you know, the s and testing that 2700 big round number. Um, but what I want to do is, is show you how if you were looking at this day by day, you probably would not have been able to see at the time the type of trend that would unfold. And look what happened to the stochastic at the bottom here. It totally got swamped. That's what they say uh, the terminology is when it got swamped. And this is not a long period stochastic. I think it's like a nine period or I don't know, 12 period or seven, something short like that. Um, so 
this is what happens a lot of times, you know, that, that people can get a little bit blindsided. And, uh, you know, then here is where we had our extended run. And um, just to show you a little trick that's kind of fun, this oscillator down here is simply the difference between a one and five period simple moving average. So it's my way of saying that this was a close below that five SMA this blue line here. And I'm not going to elaborate on that in this particular webinar because I have done that in the past for Mike. So you can go dig up past webinars that I've done and see some of the research behind what we call persistency of trend. Um, we'll always know the reasons after the fact. Perhaps the Saudis were uh, being extra aggressive in, in pumping oil, da, 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 da. But my point is that you can't see these things at the beginning when they are unfolding, although there are clues like we saw the uh, two-period rate of change, the range expansion down, and eventually back into that previous range. Normally, I like to look at structure off of just plain old bars, and this is the daily chart. So this is one of my best tricks I learned a long time ago, and you can do this on any time frame. Most of the, the things I'm going to talk about to you today are um, applicable to multiple time frames. It's the concepts that count. So the concept here is that you had a false breakout, came back down into the range, a classic uh, Wyckoff up thrust, or you could call them uh, bull traps or bear traps, whatever you want. But this close back below this previous high indicated the trap. And the first thing that we would look for would be support in the middle of the range. That would be your median value, if you want to use that word, or um, the middle of the trading range works just fine. And you can see initially we did find a little bit of consolidation down. And once we could not hold the middle of that range, we had to go and look below the lower end of that range where it accelerated and the momentum increased. So you can do that game on five minute charts, weekly charts, hourly charts, and that's fairly uh, common uh, type of market profile concept that once you start back towards that value area or that high volume node or that fluctuation of central trading, um, if you don't hold that, and that's a really important point, then you're going to continue on and, and blow through it. And that's what we did uh, with the crude. Uh, as an aside, the people that like to do measured, me you know, measured move projections would be to simply take the width of that and project it down. Um, I don't believe that there is any significant statistical significance to doing this measured move type of stuff, but I still do it because it helps to keep an open mind. And sometimes you just can't see how far something could go unless you have the smarts to step out on a weekly time frame or a monthly time frame, look at the past two years back and see what the range for the year has been and so forth. So now let's just see what happened at the bottom of this move. And I wanted to show you how eventually a trend comes into balance. And you'll see where all this is going shortly. We have our little, we've got more than our three bar breakout, one, two, three bars. We actually have five bars of price overlap, which forms our volume node. And anything under uh, a 120 minute chart, this is CQG's um, software, by the way. If I do look at this, um, I'll use the, the volume node uh, for um, measuring this, but on some of these charts I'm going to show you in a minute on weekly and uh, daily data, you can use TPOs because obviously volume is not going to be significant if you're looking at a weekly index. And if you don't have market profile software, just so you know, I'll show you some market profile charts to explain some concepts, but to clarify, I do not use it during the day. I'm not a market profile person. 
I find it extremely valuable, though, to explain concepts. And the reason why I'm not a market profile person per se is that the edges of it are just too fuzzy for me. Okay, you know, where is that value area low or high and is it going to hold or is it not? I like to look at swing highs and swing lows and gap areas and visible chart points that the whole marketplace can see. And that's how I'm going to judge my action. But with that said, you can train your eye. All right. Just train your eye to start to see the middle of these big ranges. And I always joke around and say that if you take a ruler and you were to draw a horizontal line, wherever that horizontal line goes through the most number of bars, that's going to be your uh, your volume node, if you want to call it that, or your equilibrium level or, or uh, balance area. So obviously the crude formed a big, uh, big trading range and equilibrium point at the bottom before a little bit of upside impulse. And one more concept I'll share with you for now. And I'm online with two friends that have been uh, trading for a, a good period of time too. And I can't take credit for this concept, but it just, uh, I find it so, uh, so fun in terms of explaining uh, some structure for the market. It's called the cave fill. And any time you have one big trading range and and then another range below it, um, these black areas here are the cave fills or where the, the price moved extremely quickly. And then it will very often go back and fill in uh, that cave fill area because that was one of the original uh, concepts behind market profile was eventually filling out this large bell-shaped standard deviation type of distribution, all right? But it just makes a good visual that this area up here could be a significant area. So this is what the crude then did today. Uh, we, we did go up right into the middle of this area, and this is on a 120-minute chart where we had some pretty nifty cell divergences there. I have a, a, a fun little way of coloring the bars when I get to, you know, a, a little divergence in an oscillator. And then I just simply look for a reversion back down to the moving average. So really basic. Um, now, another thing that we need to always uh, think about with our context is the long lines on the daily structure chart. So obviously with the NASDAQ, you can see we had almost a two-year sideways line or consolidation. Um, this zigzag is simply a tool created by CQG, um, but I've found that like most software programs actually have something very similar, and it's just a way of adding some structure, you know, for the eye. It's uh, nothing earth shattering. A classic trending market will have the right translation before your cycle low. Um, and what I want you to notice here is we have this huge base, this big markup period. And, and once these swings start to get shorter, you, you've now entered into the trading range environment. And this is a weekly chart, so we're not going to worry about all the little cell divergences we had up here then. Uh, but just big picture, broad two-year base, good, healthy, one and a half, two year markup. And now we're in that overall range type of, of thing. And, and we're not gonna say anything more about that right now. This is our daily chart. And uh, once again, the daily chart is gonna show more of the, the perfect test. I'm not saying anything that you guys don't know, but here was your sign. That first leg down uh, is greater than the previous upswings, greater than the previous downswing. So 
the market's always going to tell us. It's usually hitting us on the head with a two by four. If our skulls aren't thick enough, it might need an eight by eight. But uh, it's always going to hit you on the head that something has totally changed in the supply demand equation. And, uh, and that was your sign right there. And the first reaction up off of that, anytime that you have this increase in duration, in, in length and all, that first reaction up is, is a 95% type of trade. So all the pieces fall into place that you would want to be really careful buying dips once this started taking out that swing low. And at the very top, if you were a market profile person, again, you can see our three bar triangle um, where the third bar is inside the high and low of the previous two bars. I call that a three bar triangle and I can't take credit for it. It was something that I know that Richard Dennis looked at. It was written in some books in the 1950s, this three bar pattern. And about 15 years ago when I had Nigel with me or 12 years ago when we did some modeling, this particular pattern had the best success of good breakouts um, leading to a trend day, much more so than the original NR7 that was detailed out in Toby Crable's work. And I think we even mentioned it in the Street Smarts book. But this three bar breakout is a lot more powerful just because you've built a larger balance area. And the statistics behind that were that once you have your range expansion down, there's ridiculously high odds, like 90% odds that you will trade below the low of this low. I mean, of course, we bounced back and forth into part of the range, but we did take out that low as well. Now here, I'm just showing you the same thing on the candlesticks. It's a little bit distorted because the range got so great to the downside, but you can see our three bars up here. You don't need a market profile software program. Um, I always just look at the daily candles when I'm doing my nightly homework. So I'm pretty basic there. Um, and you can see the huge momentum down below the 5 SMA, the new lows on the two period rate of change. Um, our computer model that we did, a really great pattern with Nigel was to short the first close above the 5 SMA and cover on the close back below. That's a pretty high probability trade. But my main point that I wanted to make is this pattern of reaching this equilibrium, okay, is one of the things that you need to be super careful of about not being so ready to buy the dip or buy the retracement or think that you're going to trade back up to the previous day's value area or however you want to phrase it in terms of semantics. It's really hard to switch gears when you are a, a you know, a retracement type of person or looking for the buy divergences. And what typically happens, and I know because it's happened to me too a million times, is you may have missed the breakout. You may have missed the first move. The market goes further than you think it will. And the first thing that people want to do because they missed the sell side is start looking for the buy side. And that is just the biggest um, trap that I see people fall into. So be aware of that with yourself. Okay, here we also have another three bar formation. You see how it makes that little three bar triangle. And we had, we gapped down and started having a downside breakout, a trend day to the down because we had range expansion opened in the high and pretty much closed in the lower part of the range. And it's really common that if you missed the sell opportunity and it started to get away from you, instinct is going to be, oh gosh, we're already down X amount. Let me look for the buy divergences to play for a reaction back up. And you may or may not get it, but you really want to be looking for the short opportunity, not the buy opportunity. It all is so 
blatant in hindsight, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's, but you know, it's a matter of keeping it super simple and just taking what is the play for the day. That's what I always ask myself and with my homework, and I may or may not get it right the next day, but if I'm saying, what is the play for today? Um, that helps me avoid all the little noise that uh, we can see on these five minute charts. So this was coming in, this was last night, all right? Obviously everybody knew that uh, we had uh, that gap area in the S&Ps. This actually is the cash index. I put the, uh, the index up because it gives a little bit more continuous feel uh, here on the weekly charts and you can see how we've we've been testing to the upside testing to the downside um this is the whole year right here with these little lines drawn where there's been significant support or resistance areas so pretty straightforward and um i'm very much a, a person like i said watching the tests of the highs and lows and, and if we take out one low, can we go back down to the next low? And you can see we were pretty overbought coming into today and a little bit of resistance into the pocket. So I don't think today's move was any surprise to a, a lot of people. But what I want to show you here, okay, I'm just taking that previous chart right here. And now what I'm doing is I showed you the market profile type of structure going right into that high. So you can see I didn't include any of this data here. And uh, you don't need this type of software program, but you need to think about taking your ruler and where did it go through the most number of bars. I know that sounds ridiculously simplistic, but I haven't found anything else that works as great. And so what that does is if you back up and you occasionally do this once every two, three weeks on the weekly chart or even the daily chart, but kind of step back and put things into context. This was uh, eight or nine months of data. So when we did break from here, and you can obviously see the converging trend lines with the wedge, it's really difficult to see the potential for where this market could go. And um, I know I posted when this first set up a monthly sell divergence on my uh, webpage, which is a blog that I post to about once every four months. Sorry about that. Um, but uh, it's and unless you've done some work on the weeklies or even the monthlies, it's very easy to to get caught up the next day and looking for our normal trading operations. You know, here you can see all the way up. Now, keep in mind, this is a cash index. Wasn't huge range, wasn't huge volatility. It was sort of a, a grinder back and forth. Definitely had a lot more volatility in the fangs or, or some of the other stocks. Um, wasn't so blatant uh, on the S&Ps. But look where our previous level was. In fact, we tested this again today. So this has been a huge central point. And it's kind of perverse to look back in hindsight and say, oh, gee, 2018 so far has just been one big old trading range. But if you were truly sitting there thinking about trading around value or fluctuating around some central equilibrium level, I don't know about you, but this is pretty big moves opposite side of this equilibrium level that most traders probably could not stomach, right? Right, unless maybe you're an investor and you don't have a whole lot of uh, leverage that you're putting to work. So sometimes this, this theorem about trading value or around a central point 
looks great in hindsight, but it is not a great way to go about our daily operations in terms of making money. It looks great after the fact. Oh, gee, I should have known that we, you know, we just tested down into these lows and we were going to go back up to that moving average or back up to that central value. Oh, gee, I should have known that today it was going to be a, a short sale and we're going to come back down to that central value. But you know, it's just really not a practical way for us to operate because there's no guarantee either. You know, we just don't know. So we'll come back to that in a minute. But I want to just dive down a little bit. This is the 120 minute chart. And I this was at, at last night's close. And I thought, now this is going to be really interesting because not only do we have that potential gap fill, but, you know, you do have this big uh, node down here, if you will, central um, trading area. And let me just caution one more time that this, this um, thesis of these nodes or these equilibrium points of these value areas are totally dependent on your look back period. So if I included a lot more bars, this is going to change. It's just like relative strength work, right? The relative strength work looking with a 20 day look back period is going to give you a totally different subset than relative strength with a six month look back period. So you have to, there, there's no absolute when we look at these things. That's why I still frame it off by ATRs, average true range, swing highs and swing lows for structure. But this will help uh, open up your mind. And the other thing I was looking at last night was pretty good odds in a range we're gonna come back down below this five SMA. Um, so you just never know for sure. Um, this was pretty cool because this was uh, when we when we did come down to this level and we actually dropped back uh, below it a little bit and then bounced back up towards it to test it one more time. Now, the thing I want to point out here is once again, this cave fill area. All right. So if you do start trading into a cave fill area, think about it this way. This is the market pulling away from a balance level, pulling away from an equilibrium point, pulling away from uh, value, if you will. And that's nothing more than saying it's breaking support. It's breaking support or it's taking out resistance to the upside. And then that's going to cause the market to back and fill until it forms a better uh, profile or larger standard deviation type of curve in a perfect world, of course. But I just want you to, I, I don't trade with these things, but I'm using them to illustrate. Uh, all you have to do is think about drawing a central line or a little box around these trading ranges and, and the middle of it. And uh, you know, you could see once the market tipped its hand, it would have been folly to try and uh, look for a buying opportunity. It was pretty much a pure trend day down in the Russell or the small caps all day long. So we'll come back to the S&Ps, but I just want to explain some concepts looking at other markets as well. So if you're saying that that is not a good time to be looking for reversion to the mean type of trades or uh consolidation when is the safest time to look for that type of trading and that is after the market has made a large standard deviation move in fact if you step back and you looked at the S&P's big picture we made a huge standard deviation move on the weekly charts and then you could see how obnoxiously noisy the consolidation on the dailies has been all year. So here, Nat Gas, we had this uh, upside breakout. Um, the weekly charts had a very uh, prolonged triangle. Um, everybody heard after the fact, I don't know if you're an energy trader, there was a, a huge squeeze in the derivatives from uh, players and fund managers that were short the options. And as usual, sometimes these cases of people using way too much leverage um, is what can cause the market to move to extremes that we just would not anticipate. So I don't think anybody could have forecast that Nat Gas would have quite that type of move if it wasn't for uh, some shorts just getting 
brutally squeezed there and it took them all out of business. It uh, took this one guy and all of his clients went to uh, a debit balance. But look at the type of action that unfolds after that. Now, my colleague who helped me do a lot of my research, Nigel, used to call this type of trading railroad tracks. And that was because we would get one day up, one day down. You can see the choppy consolidation that we do on these daily candlesticks. A big green bar up, a red bar down, green bar up, red bar down. You see it's very noisy. And he would always call this railroad tracks, back and forth and back and forth. And you can see the little spiky tests that happen on the highs and the lows. And this is very common when a market starts to consolidate. I'm sure that you have seen this in the S&Ps on even a five-minute chart the day after a trend day. You get very noisy data, and the market is trying to – it's the process of price discovery – trying to test and see where's the support, where's the resistance. And typically, as these levels become known, you get lower highs and higher lows until the market tends to wind down to an equilibrium point. Now, this was this morning's action in the Nat Gas, and um, or else it was last night action in the net gas. And you can see this is where the huge, um, uh, most of the volume had been taking place right in here. And you can also see that there's not really any um, compelling chart formations on an oscillator, you see. So it's sort of pointless to use an oscillator many times in this type of of action because it's it's easy to to get whipsawed. It's this testing these spike rejection highs and lows, and so you have to be doubly careful about looking at breakouts or getting sucked up in that early spurt of momentum when you are in this consolidation type of mode. And we know that beforehand because we had our large standard deviation move. Now the market's consolidating. And so on my trading sheet, I'm just going to put a little star for myself not to get sucked into chasing any little short-term momentum, you see? And so uh, this is where you'd want to be extra careful about uh, not looking for breakouts it can do this for a, an extended period of time. Um, so we'll see what happens in the future. But this is what we did today. And I said to my friend online, I'm like, you know, we're going to go right up to 45.20. And we did. I know we went right up to like 45. Uh, 40 right up to here, which is actually a heck of a move if you trade this futures contract. I mean, this was evil, evil, wicked volatility if you were on the wrong side of that. These were insane, uh, you know, once in a year type of movement here. But but we did. We traded back up into there and we actually pulled back down after that. So you get the idea. It's, it's this constant ebb and flow of... Um, now, unfortunately, I don't have a continuation chart here on gold. If I did, it would look a little bit more uh, fluid. Here's the weekly chart. But you can see this long sideways line, all right, that, uh, that gold formed. And that's why some people out there, like I know there's a lot of people that follow uh, people like uh, Peter Brandt that might do breakouts from, from formations. I mean, trend followers have had a horrible year. They've had a horrible decade. I don't know how pathetic more they can get, but you would think that they would totally be cleaning up on this type of, of move. But for some reason, they have really failed to capitalize. But it might be because there is so much noise now. And you can see everything makes sense after the fact. We have this huge uh, range. And then once we came down, it was this pure trend mode down. And of course, everybody will look at the reasons after the fact. Now, how many of you are familiar with uh, the point and figure charts? It's something that's not used anymore nowadays, and I don't use it. But in classic technical analysis, it was a really good way of seeing these long sideways lines that formed. And then once you did come out the downside, 
about getting a count. Again, the same thing as if you took the width of this range and you doubled it and you just get some rough idea of the potential. It doesn't mean you will go there, but remember our job is to try and keep an open mind. And, uh, and this uh, data here on this Feb Gold is, is really dicey because there wasn't any volume here. But on the weeklies, you can see big picture We've just been in a giant trading range in gold for the last two and a half years. But yet, I think that the majority of traders I know, their bias always is 90% to the upside. I'm not sure why. And that's something we're just going to conclude with at the end of this seminar is the way our biases, our cognitive biases, really do affect our trading probably more so um, than anybody realizes. It was pretty cool because I just drove down this last weekend from Chicago to Florida. And for the first time ever, I had gotten one of those books on tape, you know, Audible. And uh, so at least it killed, a, oh, you got 20 hours to kill with two dogs in the car, I'll tell you. You know, there's only so much satellite radio you can listen to. So I, I, I downloaded Ray Dalio's book, Principles, on the Audible. And um, honestly, I would never, ever read that book from cover to cover just because it's a long book and, it, and you know, it gets kind of tedious reading so much. But when you're captive in a car and you've got, you know, 12 hours of straight listening or 14 hours, it was really awesome. And uh, I think that's my way to go from now on. If I really want to dive into the book, I'm just going to put it in the car on the radio and go driving for 12 hours. It's, it's really sinks in. So my point is, is that Ray Dalio made it quite an impression with me with his book and his understanding of the way that our cognitive biases totally play with everybody in the marketplace, including himself. He admits that flat out. You know, he likes playing the market and everything, but Bridgewater's $130 billion is run 100% systematically free of human decision making. So um, that's a comment as to how much he respects the way that our cognitive biases can um, play with our decision making. The insurance for you against that is to be extra vigilant in following a consistent process. For me, my process is always noting the swing highs and swing lows because I can't bicker with them. I can't say, mm, this is a fuzzy variable, a 70% variable. It is an absolute. So for me, the way that a market trades around a swing high or swing low, it might find initial support or resistance. It might blast through it and then come back down through it. But that's, for me, the most telling way. And then I try to take each data point one day at a time, that Bayesian type of process. So enough with the gold. I wanted to show you how this can work. We'll look at this big picture and small picture. This is on the weekly chart of copper. And I simply took this move up here in the copper to this high. It was before it broke down here to the downside. I just took this amount of data right here for this big swing up. And you can see the trap it laid at the top. I know because I I got sucked into like being a trap up there and it started to reverse. And I'm like, oh, crap. And first point was to come back down and test the middle of the range. And then when we took out the bottom of that range, I'm like, where are we going to go? And it was look where we went. This was this was done well in advance. I mean, uh, this was without the benefit of any of this data here. Whoops, sorry about that. So this concept of this cave fill, or filling in the area where there was the low volume trading or the markups, I see every single day on 120 minute charts, 240 minute charts, 30 minute charts. Um, I try not to trade off the five minute charts, but they do still serve as good little initiation triggers at times. So just keep that in mind how interesting it can be to go back 
to other periods in the in in the in history and i recognize that this is a continuation chart and sometimes continuation data is a little bit flawed especially on trade station the way they do their rollovers so play with that and, and make sure it looks okay to you with your eyeballs but cave fill so that's a great market profile concept you're you're falling out of the value area here one side's trapped and you're pulling further and further away and a trader's first instinct at least a newer trader's first instinct is going to be to look to buy the dip for a move back towards that and that is completely wrong about 80% of the time. And the way you will know that is to go down to the lower time frames and you will start to see the momentum because the short term momentum precedes the price and the short term momentum precedes the long term momentum. OK, so this is copper today. It's, I picked it because it's probably the most obnoxious market out there in terms of its noise. It has a huge Asia following, so a lot of the times the moves happen at night. Um, but I did commercial hedging in this market for a good eight years, so uh, I, I guess it's a, a sick addiction. Um, I have a love-hate relationship with it. But you can see here when we failed on the test of that high, this is why I like these swing highs and swing lows for structural points. When we came in in the morning, you were trading around here and we were playing. It could have held. It could have consolidated up here. All right. If something is going to break out, it needs to form value at that previous high. And the longer a market can trade around that previous high, all right, the better the odds are that it can go through it. But here you can see it took out that low and immediately went for the gap fill. It's hard to see that, though, if you're getting too excited about upside breakouts and, uh, and so forth. Now, as a parting shot, I know most of you don't trade coffee. I rarely trade coffee, but I wanted to show you two things. First of all, I love these 120 and 240 minute charts in general because they mirror the uh, buy days and the sell short days, the little ebb and flow of this. And this was a bottom in coffee that's so common where it fails to make a full retest down. It's called a failure test in a downtrend, a failure test, and then you take out that swing high. So I just call those little points U-turns. Now remember, I said the market is always going to hit you over the head with a sign that something is changing. And here, you can see we made new momentum highs on the two-period rate of change. We made new momentum highs on this 240-minute oscillator. You did on the hourly charts on all sorts of time frames. So that was telling you at this moment that there was a radical shift in the supply-demand equation. And it was such a strong shift that we got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, we got 10, we got 15, we got 17 closes on one side of the 5 SMA. And this is what I call that extended run. Once you hit day seven, there's pretty good odds that it's going to go further than you think it will. Now, ultimately, the market uh, had to come back into balance here. You see we start getting the price bar overlap. This is really common that we get the first close back down below is a buying opportunity. Close back up, case closed. That's a a little trade it's a high probability trade but when these trends first start going you had one two three bars that set up buying days so that's what i was saying if a market starts to run away and you were not on board here and you miss this big move up here this is what the pinball buy is when we register that 
on our little models, as long as it's above that 20 period EMA, every time in a strong trend, you then have the high to low bar, it sets up a pinball buy. So you actually had three cases here. That's, that's pretty rare. But I am pointing out that once these moves are underway, you had three opportunities where you could go in the next day with my methodology of trading the Taylor buy day. That's what I look for. And uh, you can see just the little consolidations. It was nothing dramatic in terms of a pullback. But if you are only trading one market, there is a way. So, uh, and then we can see what happened big picture. Now, just to recap, this was the daily and the weekly structure. I love these little bull and bear traps more than anything else. This is probably one of my most lucrative patterns when I can draw a big daily rectangle, just like we could uh, up at the top with that crude. And then you come back down into that trading range. And here we went back up into that range. And of course, there was a little bit of noise there. I'm not saying that it's easy, all right? Sometimes I try two or three times to try and stick with my thesis, all right? But then once you got that higher low, um, this sets up a really nice structure. Double it, and at least you'll get an initial projection. Now, what I wanted to show you here is that we had this huge trend move up, probably shorts covering and goodness knows what else. The weekly chart really didn't support any uh, better structure. So once we came into balance and you had this sort of very choppy area, I mean, for all I know, this could have been a prolonged trading range up here for a while, but the trend was over. That's my main point. Uh, so once once the trend was over, uh, again, back to my first thing about being agnostic. I don't have a fucking clue where we're going to go. All right. So I say that a lot. Now, let's just go and I want to recap today. This was our 120 minute chart. Remember, this was our node that we were looking at. Um, I'm not looking at this during the trading day live. I'm looking at that swing low there. And again, you could draw a horizontal line. You just get a general idea, right? Because everything is plus or minus a couple points or in this type of market, plus or minus 20 points. But if I wasn't wearing glasses, it would look perfectly fine to me. So we did slice through it and then we rallied back up. We were in a very strong trend. If you looked at the down volume today, it was one of the strongest trends in the down volume we've had in ages. And you can see on this five minute S&P chart, this large standard deviation move relative to the five minute time frame, right? So what did we say? We said, after we have a large standard deviation move, then you can start to trade the mean reversion and the tests. One of the things that people can use, a tool to do that is the Bollinger Band. And this is simply a two standard deviation band and what it's going to do is, at the very least, keep you from getting suckered into chasing this, all right, and thinking, oh, that's it, we're going to rally back up into the close, da-da-da, this was a, a sell climax or a sell divergence, whatever it is. But we have to constantly be saying, we're just in a trend move, we're just in a large standard deviation move. What would be the next play? Maybe it looks like a 15-minute bear flag forming. I know that we were just watching this upper uh, standard deviation band, Bollinger Band, because that's what we would do uh, on, on the day following a trend day. We always play the morning uh, tests back and forth in that. And, of course, then we actually did close and punch down lower. Now, before we uh, take questions, I just want to sum this up. I tried to keep it super simple today and basic because even though it was three main concepts, it still takes a lot to digest this. It still takes a lot to make it a habit. The only way I can do it is by writing everything down. And I still write my game plan down each night. What is the next day's play? Is there a pattern that's a breakout pattern? So 
The best trading ranges form after the markets had a large markup or markdown. That is the safest way to be looking to fade the spikes up and down. So in this case, the reversion to the mean simply means fluctuating around that big middle of that trading range, which, as you saw on the daily S&P chart, might be more than most traders can stomach in terms of volatility, but it still is giving you a model, all right? In a channeling market, the reversion to the mean is looking for cell divergences back down to a moving average or a central value like a linear regression that does have some type of slope to it. Um, you need to be very adept at trading that because it is definitely counter trend and you need to make sure that you're not stepping in front of increase in momentum and volume. All right, so that's is the second point. Once a market is channeling and pulling away from that equilibrium point, meaning the supply demand imbalance is a driver there, you really want to be in the direction of that. And if you do have patience, there is almost always some type of low risk entry. And if there's not, let it go. You're not a human algo machine and you don't have to make trades. So don't get frustrated because you missed the move and don't try and fade it because that is the biggest mistake that costs people money. All right. You need to wait till there's a little balance area or a price rejection point or some place you can pay, place an extremely tight stop. The K fill concept is nothing more than thinking about a break of support or resistance and then look to see what is the next range that you could trade back down into. And it might make it easier to go with that move if you're not normally a breakout type of person. So repeat, careful looking for retracement patterns after the higher time frame has a momentum divergence because that's what we had with these S&Ps, this monthly cell divergence, which we've only had four times in the last 40 years. If you look technically on the charts, you've only had four times in the last 40 years. And if you do go back and look at data that far back, be sure and look at a log scale. OK, secondly, be careful when the market is breaking from these three bar balance areas. It doesn't mean that every breakout is going to lead to a successful trade. A lot of times it peters out if there's not the volume there. So just be careful of that. It's not a, a slam dunk sure thing. And then lastly, 15 percent of the time there can be these V spike price rejection patterns You'll know it. You'll know it if it's a price rejection spike. Study the little candle charts, the five minute or the hourly candle charts till you know what they look like because in general, you don't want to come back down below 50% of that last big bar up. That's a very good rough guideline. And same thing, if we have a big flush down, this impulse part of the downside you don't want to be coming back up above the 50% point of that bar. Again, just a very general rule of thumb so that you don't get trapped looking for a bear flag or a continuation pattern when it's actually been this price rejection spike. I love this little cartoon because this is so true. You know, when we're looking at cognitive biases, and I've said time again, everybody has to create their own roadmap. Everybody has to come up with their own system or their methodology. But, but literally, I see people who are influenced by a tweet or influenced by somebody else's work, and instantly that's what their mind wants to think. So just be careful about that with yourself. And I think every trader has been in the spot where you're in a position and you're starting to look for the clues that support your bias or, or where you could be right, you see, even though when the market's not acting right. So have some type of black and white or objective way of determining that you're going to be wrong before you put that trade on. Come out with some level 
put a stop in or have have your your ducks in order that if you say, okay, I'm going to see if we can get a reaction up in the ticks and the ticks rally up and the S&Ps have only bounced three points and you were thinking they should bounce 15 points, that's your signal, get out, because otherwise you'll be looking and giving it the benefit of the doubt, thinking that you still should be getting more, right? I mean, I've been there. I'm assuming everybody else has been there. <laughs> you don't want to do this. You don't want to be, oh, it feels so uncomfortable. Maybe if I just look away from my monitor for a little bit, you know, like 10 minutes and check my email, maybe when I look back at it, it'll be okay. And, uh, you know, that's probably the worst thing that we can do. And I know that you've, you've seen of these before. I just have to mention that people tend to be overly optimistic, uh, you know, that the losses are felt twice as much as the gains. So we'll do anything we can to avoid the losses, meaning not take them. Okay. And our egos and our overconfidence. I mean, everybody, you know, I was writing this book, this trading sardines book, and I could look back and I could see, wow, you know, where some of my losses would come from would be after you've had this nice win and you just let your guard down a little bit and you allow that teeny bit of marginal land to creep into your trading program and not be quite as aggressive at being defensive. And a lot of times that comes when we've made new equity highs or we're a little bit overconfident for some reason. So this book was really an amazing process for me uh, of, of examining my, I've been trading full time now for 38 years and really examining myself and saying, I'm not normally the type of person I think that should have been successful in the markets because I'm not an anal retentive type of detail person, which could be very much um, an Achilles heel, all right, you know, in allowing a little bit of sloppiness. But I have other strengths that could make up for it. So it was a... Um, a good exercise for me. And just so you know, the book is not a book on technical analysis or anything like that. It's a ridiculously, insanely humorous book that I'll have to uh, post the first chapter. And um, then if you read it, maybe it'll, it'll tickle your funny bone. But in the meantime, Richard Feynman's a little bit of a hero for me. His book was one of the most powerful books I read two or three years ago. And in fact, I like his, his um, just going back occasionally and finding quotes from him. Because he really, uh, boy, for somebody that won the Nobel Prize, and by the way, he passed, you know, a decade ago, he still stated it like it is, that everything's, there's no absolutes out there, you know? And, and he was the first to say he's not absolutely sure about anything. And so that's how we have to operate in the markets, this, this process of keeping an open mind. And lastly, that was one of the things that, uh, that struck me about Ray Dalio, reading his own book, Principles. That was really cool to hear him narrating about 85% of it and how he said he would purposefully seek out people that had opinions different than his and see where the flaws in his thinking were, kind of doing the opposite of what we like to do for the confirmation bias, you know, and then seeing, well, where could the holes be in your theory or your thesis? Or if you're wrong with your thesis on the market, what would be the flip side of the coin? Where could we possibly go instead? So with that, I do have plenty of time for questions. Uh, most of you know my email, lbrgroup at att.net, or you can always contact me through the little form on my website, uh, which um, is a, something I don't rent or sell. I've, I've never blasted one blast off that thing, but it's just a way for people to get a hold of me. And um, I've got all the time in the world for questions. Okay, if you have questions, please feel free to start typing them in and I will ask them to Linda. Uh, let's see. Are the concepts that you covered today, are they in your new book? Um, 
very, very indirectly. It's, it's more like how I could manage to be on the wrong side of every possible outlier event, okay, and get whacked left and right uh, big time, you know, like putting on my largest position in, uh, in live hogs in three years, uh, two days before swine flu hit you know, and having everything go limit down against me on Sunday night, all, all kinds of stories that can uh, take your breath away. Uh, but how I still could survive that and pull myself back up by the bootstraps and, and make back uh, plenty of losses. Like I said, uh, getting smacked big time, shorting uh, 1,200 futures the hour before the Fed came out you know, and uh, took over Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. And what do you do in those cases? How do you deal with these breathtaking adverse events? You know, that's really what, to me, this business is about. It's not dealing with the normal trading and, and scalping profits and so forth. Um, but I give a lot of... Um, at least my perspective on things from uh, the analogies with with poker and, and game playing and game theory. It's it's a very it's, it's supposed to be a very enjoyable read. It wasn't meant to be a textbook type of thing. I mean, hopefully every chapter would make you laugh. But I, I give enough examples of um, how I act, absolutely got brutally slaughtered in, in so many cases, you know, and and even weird things like um, when the Trade Center was struck with 9-11, okay, I had just moved my trading operations to Refco's desk in New York, which was one block away from the Trade Center. Thank goodness they weren't in that actual building. And um, when the first plane hit, you know, everybody was sort of thinking it was little prop plane or, you know, not quite catching on that there was a major event underway. And then um, when the second plane hit, of course, immediately the whole uh, Battery Park area was evacuated. And my largest position on on that particular day was short euro dollars. And that is probably the worst market out there to be short when there is a disaster event. And I called to try and get out. And of course, the trade desk was empty and they had ended up closing down all the trading floors. And the markets remained closed for five days and there was nothing I could do. And the Fed injected billions in with liquidity. OK, and um you know, of course, when they reopened, they were radically higher against me. And, and how do you deal with that? You know, these are things where it was more a problem of not the liquidity to use proper trade management. It wasn't that we didn't have stops or weren't using trade management. And I wasn't managing money at that time. Um, but it was so it was my own account. But there's lots of situations out there where we forget to take into account the very importance of liquidity and uh, the, the a, a big theme throughout the book is it's never a problem getting into a market. It's always a problem getting out when you need to get out, just as was the case with long term capital. So, I mean, there's lessons I, you know, I, I learned from Alan Shaw, from Ned Davis, you know, a chapter on Mike Epstein and everything he taught me. I tried to give the lessons that, you know, people had taught me throughout the ages, as well as a lot of culture and history, because, you know, I feel like when I pass and I'm getting older, you know, so when I pass, you know, I don't want these things to go down, uh, you know, without being at least commented on. So that's that's what the book's about. Okay. Uh, where did my question go? Actually, you just and by touched... the way, it is not an expensive book. It's not one of these $95, <laughs> you know, <laughs> crazy books. So just so you know. <laughs> you kind of just touched on the next one, but I'll go ahead and ask it. Other than not holding through the clothes and always having to stop, what would you recommend to protect yourself from wicked volatility? So if you could well, go back you, and redo that, what, what, or what would you do, do now? I guess no one know what you know now. If if you are a newer trader, there's two things that you need to keep in mind. A, the longer the holding time, the greater the risk. 
Okay, so the, the longer you're in a position, it works both ways. Of course, the trend can work in your favor, but there's more opportunity for radical events to happen against you as well. So that's number one. Number two is your use of leverage. If there's extreme volatility in the market, I always did my position sizing by taking into account the dollar range, the daily dollar range. So right now, the S&P daily dollar range, you know, is it could be $2,000 a day. I haven't calculated it out, but, you know, when it was narrow at the top, it was an $800 a day. So you adjust your position sizing accordingly. Um, and I detail out how we did that in the book. So definitely reduce your leverage. Sec thirdly, if, if you can't handle the volatility, step back and watch because that's okay. Every day that you're watching, you're learning, you know, and we tend to, to, to gauge our productivity by, by doing. What are we doing? And sometimes you don't have to do anything. You're doing plenty just observing and, and learning that. So that always counts. And then lastly, you know, yes, I, I got annihilated on certain positions, but I was running a trading program. You know, my, my first program was short-term S&P trading. So I'd always try and make two or three day trades a day in the S&Ps. And the second program was sort of in one day, out the next, along the lines of this Taylor or some of the types of trades I show you today, the pinball, the Taylor buy, or a breakout from a three bar. And then lastly, where I had that structure, such as that daily chart structure that I showed you where you have the bull trap or the bear trap, those have the longer holding periods, and that's usually where um, I, I could experience being on the wrong side of an adverse event. But fortunately, because I'm running a, a lot of diversification and, and, and doing a lot of things, it helped smooth out um, that volatility and, and those fluctuations. And what I found is a lot of times, um, don't try and make back your loss in the market that you lost it in. So, for example, that hog was a very bitter experience with that swine flu because I also had on position in the ags and those got um, hit by some long liquidation as well. And the hogs just kind of went down the toilet for the next couple weeks. So I ended up closing out my position over two or three days best I could because they were down limit that first day. And then I just tried to put them out of my mind and you know, trade elsewhere. And sometimes that's what you have to do as well. Don't try and get even, you know, with a market that took it away from you. Direct your energies elsewhere and you might be able to think a little bit more clearly. So that's uh, the other consideration. And it takes a lot of time to build up to processing data, processing multiple markets, processing multiple time frames. So don't think that you can sit there and trade 10 markets on multiple time frames and do well because you're probably going to get sloppy or blindsided. Um, you know, when I started off, I was on the trading floor in the options, in the equity options, and I really just specialized in making markets in a few stocks. And then when I first started trading futures, I started trading the S&P futures uh, the very first day that they were listed. I, I uh, put my first trade in that book. Um, but that was the only future market that I traded for a couple years. So it takes a long time to build up tape reading skill, how you're going to organize your data, how you're going to run your program. And myself, I always find that I'll start to get in trouble when I toe the line of attempting to do too many things at once. And I'll tell you, sometimes, you know, it, it's hard. It's like me being in a Baskin and Robbins store and wanting to taste every flavor at once. I'd be 500 pounds, you know. I wouldn't do any good to myself at all. And that's what happens, you know, with these markets. It's like, geez, I'd love to trade everything all at once, but I can't, you know. So you, it takes a discipline, it really takes a discipline to wear blinders and eliminate the distractions and learn to focus and concentrate, which we can only do well for 90 minutes at a time, all right? Then you, you fall off the slippery slope. Um, then you really need to take a break and stuff. But, you know, 
just start off slowly. And if you see that you're starting to incur losses, there's a reason why. You're getting sloppy, you're getting impulsive or reactive, you're doing too many things at once, you're losing focus or distraction. If you're trading a more systematic type of thing, sometimes it could be the markets. Like there have been periods where I've traded a volatility breakout system and it just goes through drawdowns. Um, but but really examine yourself. And I, I have to like say I was totally uh, impressed with Ray Dalio talking about how he wrote everything down every day, still does. Uh, and that was his way of keeping a journal to himself. And there's uh, nothing to say that you can't do similar tricks, uh, you know, to uh, add more consistency to your program. And, and that's really the key. You know, it's the process, having a consistent process. I print off my sheets at night. I log my numbers. You know, I write down my game plan for the next day. I go outside for a run or walk the dog or whatever it might be. You know, maybe check the markets when Asia opens. Whatever your process is, try and do it consistently the same way every day. I know okay. I gave a long-winded answer. <laughs> no, you're fine. When does the book release? It is going to be out, oh my gosh, January 11th. Okay, awesome. Uh, if you sign my little guest book on my website, I'll, I'll send you a notice uh, when, when it is out. And it's, uh, like I said, it's, it's reasonably priced. Okay. Do you uh, utilize tape reading in your trading on a sh on the shorter time frames when you're during your entry or exits? Absolutely, yeah, of course. Um, I do best watching uh, the last price. I'm, I'm watching my quote board, and I like watching the net change. So if we're approaching a swing high or a swing low or an area that I, I think there might be support or resistance, or perhaps I can start to see that 30-minute uh, sell divergences or buy divergences are forming, um, that's when I'll really zoom in on the price. And, and before I short something, I kind of want to feel that it's stopped going up. And you'll see that it just starts to flicker a little bit, the price. It loses its momentum. And it's just like that tide that's going in or that tide is going out. Right at that moment, you know, there's that little bit of hang time. And, uh, you know, I want to make sure that that hang time is going to start to shift in my favor. I don't want to be trying to buy uh, you know, like catch a falling knife type of analogy. And, and so that hang time should allow you to at least put in a relatively uh, tight stop if you are that way, or, or wait till you have the wind behind your back. And then the rest of the time you can back off a little bit because now it's either working or it's not working. If it is working, you, you know, you kind of have a general idea. Is it going to trend for the day if there's an increase in volume or is this just a noisy rotational day in which I'm going to play for just a small piece only um, so but yeah that the entries tend to be probably where I'm going to uh, be most attentive to my initial trade location and of course now sometimes when the market's breaking out or moving you know you just I, I, I'm ready I'm banging it at the market, you know, because uh, I have a pretty good idea that that train is leaving the station. But trust me, I mean, there's a lot of times I don't have a, a good feel like anybody else. Okay. Uh, you're famous for the Linda 310 MACD. Can you talk about the MACD or other indicator and describe a unique way you, you use it? You know, that's what you saw on uh, my my charts, and I really can't take credit for that because that was the original oscillator uh, that was published by Security Market Research, SMR, um, and this was back in 1980 when we didn't have charting software program, and I know Marty Schwartz used to get those charts, and Larry Williams, and the person that uh, backed me on the floor used to get them, so that's how I started using them and it wasn't till about a decade later that I figured out it was essentially a normalized 
uh, reading of the difference between a three and 10 period simple moving average. So it's much noisier or put, put it this way, a little bit more sensitive than uh, the MACD with the exponential moving averages because that tends to be sort of a higher time frame out. And um, it, it would be like looking at a seven period or a nine period stochastic. And, and quite honestly, I'm not watching every wiggle and jiggle. The problem with an oscillator like that is on the lower time frames, there's a higher noise level. So truly, if, if you looked at, say, a five-minute chart versus a 120-minute chart, you'll see that the oscillator is a lot smoother and it doesn't have quite as many wiggles and jiggles in it. And so all I do is I look at it to sort of help me see the bar chart on the fly. I'm really looking at the bar chart and then I'm sort of confirming that the oscillator is forming some type of, of uh, pattern that's just going to give me a little bit added confidence and, and perhaps just at selective points. Like today we were rallying back up towards that 15-minute uh, moving average, which I would expect that we would fall short because it was a trend day down and it's pretty rare that you hit that 15 minute moving average on a trend day, you know, but we did have a reaction up that hit that uh, five minute EMA, which is also where I showed you with those Bollinger bands. So, you know, at that point, you can, you can kind of see the double bump. I like to see the ABC, you know, or, or that two part rhythm in it. Uh, I find those tend to be sometimes the best risk reward points, if that makes sense. Okay. Uh, during an uptrend, how do you determine whether to enter a single retracement or wait for a power buy signal? Describe. Yep. So a power buy is nothing more than that. ABC type of consolidation. And uh, I think it was actually like Elliott Wave that talked about the alternation between a simple consolidation and a more complex one. And as a general rule of thumb, you'll have two simple bull flags or continuation patterns, and then you'll have a more complex one. So uh, it's just really how aggressive you want to be. If it's a simple bull flag, um, you know, two out of every three will be that way, and you'll probably play for a single time frame type of profit objective, meaning a test of the high or low or uh, looking for a measured move type of swing. And when you have a more complex type of consolidation, what that really does is, a, is establish a larger equilibrium point or consolidation or volume node or value area or whatever you want to call it so that then when the trend resumes, you can often get um, a more significant swing. So, uh, and you never know for sure, you know, a lot of times you, you just do your best, you put it on and if it doesn't work out like you thought, maybe take part off or scratch it or, or try again. So, uh, you know, sometimes it's a little bit of feeling your way out. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, what do you think of intraday scalping that seems to be very popular among retail traders today? Well, I think that anybody that's newer to the market needs to learn how to scalp first because it's all about execution skills. And, you know, when I went and first went down to the to the trading floor, that's what we did. We're in the pits. You know, I'm I'm learning how to flip one option for an eighth. You know, I'm not getting rich during that, but I, I'm learning, you know, how to buy and sell and the timing of it and, you know, quit my little heart from beating and adrenaline rushes. And it's sort of a desensitizing process. So honestly, I know extremely few people who make a, a living scalping, okay? And I'm talking about a living. I'm talking about making a decent, you know, yearly uh, a figure, you know? And um, the problem is, is that most people that get engaged in intraday scalping 
tend to overtrade. You know, that's where they start to get into trouble. You see these people that are making 20 trades a day. And I don't think that you can really do well that way. I mean, I've only seen one person that seems to make constant trading activities, and that is uh, Big Al with Al Brooks' his, his website on price action, you know. But he doesn't disclose what he's doing. You know, he'll he'll buy at the high of a bar and exit for four ticks, and and he's he's pretty fast. So I would hesitate to say just how much scalping he's doing or I also know he does some options and hedges a little bit on the side but if you wanted to pursue that type of trading activity which is really intensive I would suggest uh, joining his room and following it and um, see his process because he is he's very even keeled and very even tempered um, and uh, but very few people do I know sit there and make a good living making 20 trades a day? The, the people that I know that tend to do well um, day trading tend to make more like two to four trades a day, maybe five, two to five trades a day, and they might only be trading just the S&Ps. And that's what I would suggest is get really good at one market first. So make that your bread and butter. Keep in mind, it's okay to scratch. If I was taking a newbie under my wings, that's what I would do. I, I would I would put in a buy stop, and we've done this before. I'd put in a buy stop and say, the minute you're filled, I want you to scalp out for a tick or two, just so that you get a feel for the tape, putting in the trade, seeing the time or if there's any latency or how it hits, and um, to totally desensitize yourself for a bit. So you have to start off somewhere. The longer you're in the markets, the more experience that you get, then I think it's suitable to extend your time horizon a little bit more. Okay. Uh, what is the name of the book? I missed um, earlier. It's Trading Sardines, uh, Lifelong Lessons of a Professional oh – wait, something like that. I don't even know the name. Lifelong <laughs> Lessons from a Lifelong Trader, Trading Sardines. That's all you have to remember. I put the okay. uh, cover and the table of contents on my uh, website, and I'm, I'm in the process of trying to get the first chapter up there. So just give me a week. Okay. Uh, let's see. On your largest accounts, what percentage of account size do you risk? Is the sizing consistent, or does it depend on the perceived opportunity and risk of each trade? That's a really good question because there's so many schools of thought in that area. Don't risk more than 2% or da-da-da-da-da. For me, I'm, I'm, I'm one that believes in a constant bet size. Okay, I'm going to make the same bet no matter what I think the opportunity is because I can't tell where those big wins are going to come from. And I don't want to bet too small on what may be the big win. And I don't want to bet too you know, overextend myself on, on a sloppy, choppy market. So I calculate my unit size. Um, recently, I've just been doing it once a quarter, but I have a unit size, N number of contracts per X number of dollars in the account. And as the account increases, I'll uh, obviously add another contract to my unit size. So it's pretty constant. And then I've n I've never risked more than uh, two percent on any trade, other than the fact that I got slammed in that uh, outlier when Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac uh, came along, and and maybe one or two others. But um, yeah, I I would rather play more markets. And and then the other thing is you have to be mindful of correlation. So it's not just the bet size in the S&Ps or the crude or the gold or the dollar, but a lot of times you have to be mindful of the correlation. So if I'm trading two highly correlated markets, I'll trade half a unit on each of them and just try and be very consistent about that. I don't want to make decisions during the trading day. I don't want to be trying to figure out uh, how much I should put on each time. I have my execution platform set to the same size for each contract 
not the same size for each contract, but each contract has a preset size. So for example, I might be trading um, twice as many corn futures as I am crude oil, you see. I might be trading three times as much uh, gold contracts as I am natural gas because of the dollar size of the range, but it's all determined ahead of time. Okay. Uh... He just answered that one. Sorry, there's a lot of questions. I'm trying to. Hey, that's okay. I'm on a diet. I ate so much driving down here. I don't need dinner tonight. <laughs> okay, uh, we're getting long on time, so I'm going to make this the last question. Uh, he says, hi, Linda, I'm a beginning trader trying to find my edge, know my personality, and get to find a trading method that works for me. What resources, tips, and what activities would you look to if you were in my position? Um, years ago, I, uh, I met a person through the MTA. His name was Bob Perlman, and he was a retired engineer. He had sold his machine shop. And at the time, his cousin was the largest gold trader on the floor up in New York. And so Bob knew his way around the markets a little bit. He had been part of an investment club. And when he was retired, he decided that he wanted to trade. And this was back in, uh, hmm, like, I think around 2000 and um, no, it was like 1996, 95, right around then. So what Bob did uh, is he took two years and he explored everything out there. Now, this is just what he did for himself. For example, he subscribed to Steve Moore's seasonal programs and did seasonal spreads for three months to see how he liked that. He purchased... Uh, then he had purchased Bob Buran's volatility breakout system, and that's uh, one of the things that he introduced to me, and he traded that for three months to see all the work that was involved in the record keeping and the pros and cons of that. And he did this for at least a year and a half of trying out a certain style or certain method. Uh, how was it trading equity options? But he would do each one in a very thoughtful manner for three months. And then at the end of it all, he decided that he really just felt most comfortable trading the S&Ps on a five-minute chart and was waiting for um, those three pushes patterns. And he was actually the one in the Street Smarts book that gave that name three Indians to the one, two, three pushes at the end of the swing. And he specialized in doing that, just day traded, took it off. But his journey was about two years. And then at the end of his journey, he felt really good about trading that style. He enjoyed trading. This is what he did and what he knew. And it became a fun game, but it was a lot of grind initially, trial and error. So I would say just like um, any uh, medical doctor that's doing internships or residencies through uh you know, after their graduation, they usually go through different, um, oh, I forget the word, you know, but different uh, rotations, you know, trying different fields. And so think about that as part of your education as a trader, you know, going through different rotations, lower your expectations that you're going to make money because you probably won't. You just don't want to pay too much tuition in the meantime and understand that it can take three years to see the full play of bull markets, bear markets, low volatility, low VIX, you know, pathetic uh, volume markets or explosive volatility. And, uh, you know, it takes a while to see all these different environments. And um, not only that, each decade, there is what they affectionately refer to as some type of 
regime change, for example, going into that low interest rate environment, zero rate interest rate environment that we did in 2010 and so forth with the advent of quantitative easing. I don't know what the next decade will bring for us, um, but it's not going to be like the previous decade. So just have a lot of patience and, and enjoy everything you learn. I kept notebooks and every book I read, I would, I would jot down stuff. And every system I examined, I would jot down stuff and I would print off charts. And um, you have to really enjoy doing that. You know, it's like a little scavenger hunt. And, uh, and then the making the money part isn't the main issue. You have to take that out of the focus and just learn to marvel at the market's symmetry or its perversity. And, uh, you know, once you reach that point, I think it's the learning part becomes a, a more enjoyable process. Okay. Thank you for the uh, webinar today, for the information, and for uh, spending some time with us this evening. You're welcome. I enjoyed it as always. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Bye.